Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Well, I guess if you're on the East Coast or further east, it is not morning. Good morning, Dave, George, Jerry, J JD. How's good to see you there, buddy? Lawson, Linda, Killian, Katie, Jenny, the people are Hunter, Dylan, L. All right. You guys are streaming in here. It's great to see everyone. I hope you are doing amazing on this wonderful Tuesday. Hey there, Lawson. I would love, as I always often do, uh, please put in the chat where you are joining from. I'd love to see so everyone can see where everyone is coming from in the country, in the world. Warren, Michigan, Brainerd, Minnesota, Fort Hill, South Carolina, Frederick, Colorado, Cajun country. Yes, JD, you are. Looking forward to the crawfish boil in a few weeks. Um, Bozeman, Montana, Idaho, Ripley, New York. Awesome. BC, thank you. Up north, Charlotte, beautiful. Fantastic. Surrey, BC as well. Ingrid, David, Toronto, Chicago. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining me. I, um, I'm flying solo today. I don't have any co-pilots. And uh, Linda, oh, good to see you, Linda. Awesome. From Wooddale, Illinois. Great. And uh, Kyle is in Jacksonville, Florida. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, uh, the chat is great for putting comments, reactions, anything you want where you're, where you're joining from. Um, I'd love for you, if you have any questions for me, please put them in the Q&A section and, uh, and we will get to some Q&A at the end. Um, uh, hey dad, my dad is on from Eugene, Oregon. Um, as his real name, not, not his pseudo name, Ben Dover, as, as he sometimes joins as. <laughs> but uh, Katie with Ec in Ecuador, amazing. Um, all right, we are, definitely have an international presence here. So, all right, we are talking today about um, making 2023 your best year ever. And I'm gonna be highlighting uh, things that I've learned over the years and things that I've seen the best customers of ours and the shops that I've toured and the owners that I've talked with, just what they are doing. Um, so for those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Paul Van Meter. I am one of the co-founders of ProShop. I used to own a machine shop myself and this that's where we built ProShop and we sold that company, geez, it's, it's actually seven years ago now. So time flies when you're having fun. Um, and now we bring pro shop to the world and try to, uh, what we try to do is deliver powerful manufacturing software by deeply understanding our clients challenges in order to meaningfully, meaningfully improve their businesses and in turn their communities. And that communities part is super important to me personally. And it's through these webinars that we try to help all shops meaningfully improve their businesses, not just clients, obviously. Um, and of course we deeply would appreciate becoming a partner and, a, you know, and, and work with you. But even if we never do, I hope these, these uh, webinars bring you uh, value and ideas to help your shop grow and thrive and improve your local communities. So there is no doubt about it. I've, I, I will go to my grave saying that running a job shop, a machine shop is one of the hardest jobs in the world. It is um, just really, really challenging. It's expensive. The margins are generally low. There's all sorts of risk. Um, and the companies and the owners that start these businesses truly put their blood, sweat, and tears into your, into your companies. Um, you know, I've talked to so many owners who have, you know, taken out mortgages or um, save, taken all their life savings and put it into their businesses. And and many of them came from the industry as a machinist or a tool and die maker, or they worked for some other shop doing something. And they said, you know what? I want to do this for myself. I want to be my own boss. I want to start my own company. But most shop owners don't have any formal schooling or coaching on how to run a business, but they are brave and they jump in with both feet and do it anyway. Uh, and I have huge respect for that because it is so challenging. Um, and the best shop owners, the people that I talk to that are doing the best, the companies that are thriving, they are, um, there's qualities that I have seen come through over the years. They are curious, they are humble, um, they put their egos aside, they, they accept and ask for help. I think in particular, 
um, you know, we're seeing a lot more diversity in, in the industry, thankfully, a lot more uh, women shop owners, but, uh, but it's still pretty dominant by men. And men, just to get a little touchy-feely on all of you, you know, generally have a hard time asking for help, right? They want to be the best at everything they do. They want to be perceived as experts. They want to be perceived as having all the answers. I know I certainly have suffered with that for, for decades. Um, but it's, it's good and it's right to ask for help and to realize you don't know all the answers. And so that's some of the things that I will talk about today are um, just realizing that, that you don't need to do this all alone. Um, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to get partners. It's okay to talk with other, um, with other shops, to get in community, to network and, uh, and learn together. So what are some of the most successful shops doing that I have seen over my decades in the industry? One of the most first fundamental things is being a sales-driven organization. Uh, this picture is of my first machine shop, our first shop. So we see a couple of my business partners in the back there. Um, started with a little tiny 2,000 square foot warehouse in 1997. Yep, thank you. Abra dropped the, uh, our, our origin story video. Uh, I will mention they're gonna be dropping a lot of video links um, and other links in the chat. So you're welcome to open those up as tabs in your browser. But when we send out the video recording of this, we will send a PDF with all the links for everything. So you don't need to worry about um, about capturing every single one if you, if you don't want to. Um, so that was our shop. We started out, uh, and speaking of funding it, uh, the guy on the right, Darcy, he took out a second mortgage on his house and that was enough for us to buy a Haas VF4, a used manual mill and lathe and, uh, and pay for this rent, you know, for this little space for a few months. And we started knocking on doors. Um, and of course, at the beginning, that's, the, that's how we got our work, but we truly were not a sales driven organization. Um, we, uh, it was between 97 to 2001 was actually a pretty good time in the economy. You know, it wasn't that hard to find business, but after 9-11, we, uh, we almost went out of business and we realized that we were not doing the right things to run a business. You know, it was easy to be successful at, between 97 and 2001, just so without a lot of actual skills, we, we managed to do okay. Um, but, uh, we were not a sales driven organization and it was a very tough lesson to learn back then about why it was so important to always be investing in sales and marketing. So we, uh, we, uh, we got help actually from a local small business development center, which is a nationwide network, usually associated with, with universities. So small business development center, write that down. If you want help, they often provide counseling and business help for free. So hopefully there's one near you if you want some guidance on some of this, or they really, I mean, they guided us through so many things, including uh, not getting going bankrupt. So, but at the very beginning of our shop, um, and even after we had this additional coaching, I would literally, because I, I was, I sort of landed in the sales role um, after, you know, the first uh, year or so as we started to kind of specialize as we grew the company. And I literally had an aluminum briefcase just like this that I would, that I had foam uh, sort of fill, filled with foam. And then I would cut out the foam and I would inlay all these machine parts that we made. And I would go around and I would literally cold call companies out of the phone book. I would look at, find websites, you know, for companies near us. And I'd call them up and I'd say, hey, do you guys need to buy machine parts? And I would try to get uh, an appointment with the buyers or with the engineers. And I'd go in there and I'd show them my briefcase of all the parts. And I had also a little portfolio of parts pictures that were too big to put in my briefcase. And I just tried to make personal relationships with these people. And um, it's slow and it's, it's hard work and there's a lot of rejection, but it's something you have to do. As we got more mature and later on, when we really wanted to differentiate our company from everyone else, we realized that, you know, there's every shop has fancy machines and you know, has on their website, they have great quality and delivery, and we need to differentiate ourselves somehow. So we started publishing a DFM or design for manufacturability newsletters, which ultimately turned into boot camps. And 
we built up, I think we paid uh, some website that had a newsletter that sent to engineers. If we could send some newsletters through them, some email blasts through them. Um, and our ask of those people that clicked on our, on our email was to sign up for our DFM newsletter. And so over the course of a couple of years, we built up maybe a couple thousand engineers at hundreds and hundreds of different companies. And the feedback we started getting was this is great advice. We love it. And we'd love even more. So people started asking if we would could come on site and do um, boot camps, uh, you know, training on site for, for their engineers. So we did probably close to 30 of those over a three or four year period. And quite honestly, um, I think this is a good example of doing well by doing good, because we, although we certainly wanted to win work from them, we um, went into those uh, sessions and the, and the things that we published with no expectations that we were going to get anything back from it. We just wanted to share knowledge of how they could cut the cost of their parts and the lead times by making them easier to make, easier to machine, less scrap, less whatever. Um, and, uh, and it really helped. We just gave and gave and gave. And ultimately, it came back to us in, you know, millions of dollars worth of business over the next several years. So I think the importance of giving, I guess that's kind of what we're doing here today. We're trying to just share knowledge and, uh, and you know, sort of believe that the karma of doing that will come back to you many times um, in the future. So, so some practical advice about sales and marketing stuff. Definitely invest in it. it. It is if you can hire full time employees to do that. I know especially small shops can't do that. You know, while you're still small, you don't have the budget to hire a salesperson. Um, when you can do it, um, or if you if you are an owner and you want to, or you you want to do that yourself, you can you know backfill and have people, you know, offload the work that you normally would do. So you can go focus on being the sales and marketing person at your company. Um, you know, no one can do it better than you, honestly, but um, it's really deciding how you want to spend your time. But getting out there, um, you know, networking, improving your website. Uh, years and years ago when, so we, you know, again, 97, we started our shop. The internet was just barely a thing back then. But we actually focused quite heavily on our website and SEO, search engine optimization. Um, it's pretty much free. It doesn't cost much to do SEO unless you hire a company to do it for you. Uh, and one of the best things that we did, and I've subsequently heard this from really wise people, including one of my podcast guests, is really focus on niches. You know, being a generalist shop, just I'm a job shop, I can do anything. You know, that can work, but that, that the phrase, the riches are in the niches is a phrase for a reason. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but we really sort of made sure that in our, in our uh, website, we had these what we call long tail keywords that were very specific about the types of work we were really good at. Um, so for example, we did, um, you know, cockpit display panels. So highly cosmetic, lots of tiny little intricate tools, you know, bead blasting, anodize, all sorts of things that we became very good at. And so we, you know, we had special website pages just for that with pictures and lots of descriptions of those types of parts. And when a company is searching for a vendor for that type of work, they are much more likely to find your website than if you just say, we are a machine shop and we serve lots of industries. So, so focus on that. Uh, again, yeah, don't be a generalist. Um, and then get out there and network, right? Uh, trade, I'll talk about some, some shops that are just really killing it with doing trade shows, um, doing networking events. We are a member of NTMA and I highly encourage industry memberships like those. They are just great places to learn, great places to network, uh, great places to potentially find customers as well. But it's that don't go it alone, you know, ask for help, build a community around yourself. Uh, the best shops are doing those things for sure. When you are out at an event or you get someone on the phone, if you're cold calling, you got to practice your pitch. You don't want to just say, hey, I own a machine shop. We have eight machines and we do machining work and we have good quality, right? Everyone can say that. So getting very specific, you only have that one chance to make a good first impression so if you can say something like my shop are experts in delivering high quality cockpit display panels, we partner with our clients to cut costs, reduce risk, 
and produce flawless precision parts on time. That is something they're going to remember. And whether you're at a trade show, whether you're on the phone, you know, they're much less likely to hang up on you and say, yeah, sure, we do have parts like that, you know, and we sometimes have trouble with our vendors. So, uh, so work on that pitch. Uh, I can't stress how important LinkedIn can be for shops. I've talked to many shop owners that say they get a vast majority of their work from LinkedIn. So um, it's just a great place to you know, build your company page out, make sure your logo is there, make sure you have links to back to your website, share pictures and videos of the projects you make, uh, tell a story of how you saved a customer with a short lead time or you know, some, uh, another vendor dropped the ball and you picked it up and, and delivered for them. Um, you know, share human stories about your employees, about what you're doing, about your barbecue, you know, personalize your, your brand, your message, and, um, but share value, right? Also like my DFM newsletters, you know, share things that are gonna provide value to shops and do it, really, do it reliably. Um, you know, doing it in fits and starts is not gonna be nearly as effective as doing it, you know, week in and week out for, uh, for, for a long, long time. And if you do have prospects that you specifically wanna target, um, make sure you take the long game in how you're going to do that, right? If you, if there's a company, you know, near you, that's a perfect type of prospect for you, um, you know, start by engaging with the content from their company, from their people, their leaders, their, their employees, you know, share, share their, their posts, you know, comment on them and comment some, comment something thoughtfully, not just, you know, thumbs up, right? put some thoughtful effort into, into sharing what they're talking about and commenting, and then build up some, some familiarity with you and your company, and then go ahead and, you know, start uh, getting into their direct messages and saying, hey, you know, I'd love to talk to you about being a really solid supplier, reducing your risk, and all those kinds of things. So definitely take the long game. Just, don't just blitz someone out of the blue with, uh, with a sales post or a sales message. So one of the other things that clients, uh, clients, companies are doing um, or not doing is inconsistent adoption of technology. So for most of the shops that are on this call today, certainly those that are clients, um, I know you guys are investing in software, but uh, hardware is also super, super critical. Um, I'd say the shops that I see that are thriving the most are definitely on the cutting edge of more sophisticated machines, more sophisticated software, more sophisticated business processes. Um, and that is making a difference. So um, it doesn't, so that being said, and as, as I, so some of the, some of this webinar is, um, is built off of a blog that I, that I published a few weeks ago called the haves and have nots uh, shops. Cause I'm seeing this widening gap um, of shops that are just crazy busy and shops that are not busy at all or really not consistently busy. And it's troubling because to me, I want every shop to thrive and we need every th shop to thrive given how much demand there is coming back into our country and our, and our, um, our continent from overseas. Uh, you know, COVID accelerated that, but I think that trend was already happening even before COVID started. So there's a lot of uh, there's a very bright future for precision manufacturing in North America, and it's it's a shame if every shop isn't uh, isn't uh, having success uh, because they're not doing the right things. So, as I was writing that blog and as I was thinking about this and to thinking about you know shops that are buying fancy five axis pallet machines and all sorts of stuff like that, uh, actually I realized that that while that is important and that can really drive efficiency and, and effectiveness and cut lead times and um, cut cost. There are many shops that are really doing super well without investing in a ton of really expensive fancy machines. So you don't have to, but it can certainly and does help. Um, and I'll highlight a, a shop a little later that uh, has um, a really nice variety of good solid machines. None of them are super, super fancy or expensive but they're absolutely crushing it. Um, super busy, enormous backlogs, highly profitable, just doing great um, with, other, with everything else that they're adopting and doing. So 
So of course, I'm, I uh, am biased on this, <laughs> given the business that I am in, but really building solid business processes based uh, in lean manufacturing and software can be just an enormous, um, an enormous benefit for uh, the success of a company. And I'll talk a little bit later about it on sort of the sales side, but um, we have definitely seen um, companies that are just really doing super well with uh, making themselves stand out from the crowd and, and sort of the, the, um, the competitive you know, nature of so many shops out there um, by, by using technology well uh, and sharing how they're using it with their customers. This is, we added this, this uh, I wasn't quite sure what to actually say on this slide. We added this just a few minutes ago. Of course, we don't generally, uh, business doesn't, doesn't generally love regulations, but what I mean in this example is pursuing industry certifications and really being proactive on things like cybersecurity. Uh, I will highlight, and I know I have some customers here on the, on the, uh, the call today, um, that have done an incredible job with this, um, but pursuing, you know, ISO, AS, 1345, API, um, whatever it might be that is sort of your, your niche, your specialty, or if you want to get into that niche, it really does open doors. Um, there are lots and lots of OEMs that are becoming more stringent about what types of clients, or excuse me, what types of vendors they will allow to work with them. And for many of them, if you don't have AS9100, you just cannot get you know, a foot in the door. So uh, historically, these have been very expensive. And I'll talk a little bit later about how, shop, how ProShop makes that less expensive, faster, easier to get in the first place, and then less onerous to manage uh, sort of along the way. But, uh, but I definitely can stress, if, you, if you're on the fence about this at your shop, um, I, would say, I say do it. Um, you know, and, if, and if you want help, of course, we can help make it really uh, a lot less expensive. And here in my next slide is uh, a client that has done an absolute incredible job. There you go, Chandler. Um, uh, so Coastal Machine and Supply, historically and still very heavy into the oil and gas business, but they, after implementing ProShop, yeah, there's a, a video that we did um, with Coastal. Uh, they pursued AS9100, uh, got it very quickly and efficiently, and then aggressively pursued uh, defense, aerospace, and commercial space industries. And now that accounts for a pretty decent portion and growing of their business. Um, and they did it because they, they saw the importance of doing that. They had the free time uh, to do that after implementing ProShop. And uh, they've just absolutely executed it flawlessly. So really, really great example. So check out their website, check out their video. Um, really an inspiring example. Cybersecurity is becoming increasingly important. It will make or break shops. Uh, there is no question about it in my mind. Um, all of you that have been following the CMMC uh, regulation, well, of course, will know that it has evolved. It started out with 1.0, and then it changed to 2.0, and they keep picking out, pushing out the deadline but it is absolutely coming. They are not gonna back down from it. Um, in one form or another, you know, in the next year or so, it will be requirement for any company that's in the defense industrial base or the DIB, they call it, or serving the government sector in any way, even if you're a sub, you know, a sub tier vendor to a company that ultimately does. If your company is managing um, federal contract information or controlled unclassified information, which is basically what drawings and models and G code and all those things are, that's, that's called CUI. Um, you will need uh, really robust systems. And I've seen a lot, a lot of shops kicking the can down the road. They are deciding uh, to not proactively pursue it. They, um, or they're very sort of idly doing it. Um, when the requirements finally do hit, and it will, be a it will be mandated that you cannot even quote on something in the defense space without having a CMMC certification. There's going to be a mad rush to try to get auditors to come in and consultants to come help your company get certified, um, become compliant. 
and it's just going to be a madhouse because there's not nearly enough auditors out there to meet the demand of the 300 plus thousand shops that will need or, or manufacturers and suppliers that will need to get that certification. So stop kicking the can, do it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we can help with that. Um, but however you do it, uh, just do it. I, I am confident that even companies that are not part of this industrial you know, defense base will start flowing down the requirements to their vendors regardless. So even if you're in oil and gas, if you're in commercial aerospace, if you're in medical, you know, the, the big OEMs out there, they do not want their data to be hacked because your shop doesn't have a secure network or, um, or uh, you know, you get hacked and they, they steal drawings and models. So um, Linda, I will get to how ProShop can help with CMMC a little bit later. Thanks for the question. Um, but uh, yes, so super important but a little bit longer term. So here I'm gonna highlight a bunch of companies that are just doing really well and embodying some of the things that I just talked about. So let's go take a, let's go take a, a look here. Um, and so again, tying back to that blog that I wrote, you know, these shops that are, I call it in the have category, they are busy, they have good backlogs, they are, they are well diversified. Um, they had to start somewhere, right? They didn't start that way. Um, and coming back to my point earlier about, you know, most shop owners get into the business without a really deep bench of experience of how to run a business, right? They, again, a lot of them were technicians or they maybe grew up in the family business, uh, learned from watching their parents or aunts and uncles do it, but um, still don't have a lot of formal to, uh, you know, formal schooling and how to do that. So you got to start somewhere. And changing the mindset of, I want to learn how to become a really good business person and run my business in a sustainable, profitable, process-driven way is a big mindset shift uh, from, you know, I have a bunch of machines, I need to make chips and uh, keep those spindles busy. So, uh, so it. uh, it, uh, it, it takes, again, takes a mindset, takes some forward longer term thinking rather than just, you know, what's happening tomorrow, but it is so, uh, so, so important. All right, let's talk about a few examples of shops. Um, none of these shops know I was going to talk about them, but uh, hopefully they're okay with that. Thompson Precision in Idaho, fantastic example of a shop that is really doing well in a specialized niche. So they decided several years ago to focus on doing finished machining of metal 3D additive parts. And they have absolutely thrived in this, in this very niche area. Um, and so they, do, they work with a lot of commercial space companies because uh, lots, of, lots of that commercial space stuff uh, is becoming more and more 3D metal printed. But um, finished machining of those has always been a challenge for, for most, for most companies that need that, that kind of, those kind of parts. So they decided to specialize in that. Um, I talked to, to their president, Steve, at a trade show recently, and he just reinforced to me how important it is to really niche down. Um, he, of course, the fact that he was at a trade show is another example. He was, he's out there with a beautiful booth and meeting people and talking, uh, talking to prospects and talking to customers. On the technology side, um, this is the shop that I wanted to mention earlier, JJR Engineering and Fabrication. Um, they, uh, quite honestly, have, you know, most of their machines are Haas machines, so not the fanciest machines in the world, but they have truly adopted significant, uh, you know, software technology, uh, lean manufacturing, um, incredibly data-driven company, um, truly a paperless shop floor. And you'll even notice, and this I loved when I was vis- we were there visiting uh, to shoot a video, which will hopefully be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Even this, this assembly station here, which was very well labeled, had uh, this number 1500, which is the assembly operation number that they were using in ProShop. So they basically rearranged their entire shop floor, made it very visual um, and very clear about how the flow of product matches physically what's happening in the digital side within ProShop. So um, 
I'm really excited for that video to come out. They're just such an amazing company. Um, and they are also um, really setting themselves apart from their competition by showing their customers and showing their prospects how uh, technology driven they are. So um, yeah, really neat shop, um, great example. On the automated side, more on the equipment side, um, just right here in our town, Holtz, Holtz Enterprises, Holtz Racing Products, you know, has invested in some highly automated machines, you know, this, uh, this Mitsura pallet pool, they have lots of um, really cool uh, multi-axis uh, bar fed lathes, and even to the extent of they built, I wish I had a picture of it, I don't, um, just amazing racks on the tops of their machines that feed that feed into their bar feeders so they can run even more unattended time um, uh, because they, you know, they, they're not just loading in one bar at a time. They have a rack with, you know, 10, 15, 20 bars that they can just load up and it can run for literally days on end, almost unattended. So really a neat example of a company doing that well. Uh, another local sh shop, Iron Gate Machine, um, they have invested in, you know, they have two multi-spindle pallet pools they have really high-end offline tool presetters, shrink fit holder, uh, you know, systems. Um, they have lots of multi-spindle lathes. They are really upgrading their equipment all the way around, not just the machines, but all the support equipment that goes into it. They've invested heavily and it's really paying dividends in how they're executing, how they're cutting costs, uh, the impression that their customers get of just how technology driven they are on the cutting edge and uh, just a great example of a really nice shop doing that well. On the sales driven side, I'll highlight a couple of companies. Uh, Affinity is a company up in Vancouver, BC. Um, they are out at trade shows, they are doing social media, they are out there meeting people, sharing their sample parts. Um, you know, I grabbed this off of a, uh, I think it was a, I said on LinkedIn, I guess, but it might've been an Instagram post, you know, using little graphics, uh, and of course, this website they got years ago, presumably amazing, machining.ca. What an incredible website name to get. Um, but uh, always, you know, has been sort of a, a company that's really driven to do things super well. Um, and they're, the way they're doing their sales, I think, is just, uh, is just a remarkable way to do it. Rouse Sheets Manufacturing Solutions, truly a world-class facility and a world-class company. Um, you can see from this picture you could, the whole thing literally eat off their floors. You know, it's kind of a cliche. You could actually do that at this company. Um, and they don't have a cleaning crew. All their machinists just kind of keep on top of things. Um, always clean as you go. They keep a spotless facility. They are heavily invested in both technology on the hardware side. This is what they call Haas Alley, who's one of their, one of their partners, but they have rows of, of Yazda pallet machines and Makinos and really nice high-end lathes, multi-spindle lathes. Um, they have their CMM machines have pallet feeders, uh, just incredible. So they can keep inspecting things at high rates without having the machine sitting. So they feed the parts into a pallet pool that can feed to two different, CN or two different uh, CMMs right next to each other. Just really incredible company. And also an amazing company on the sales and marketing side. If you follow them on LinkedIn, and I encourage you to do so, they are always posting about their equipment, their machines, their, their certifications, their partners, what they're doing to you know, meet, meet and exceed client needs. It's just truly a world-class uh, operation all around. So definitely follow them for some inspiration. On the networking side, um, I was, uh, this is a, a shop that, um, that we know well, and uh, I was at two different events over the last few months, you know, local one was a defense networking event and the other was an aerospace event and they were there, right? They were there meeting people, doing business to business meetings, um, meeting with existing clients um, and just, you know, putting themselves out there and, uh, and uh, not just holding up in their shop, hoping that, you know, work comes in the door. So. Great example. And I also, Abra, thank you for posting um, the link. Uh, I interviewed Ann Dyke uh, on my podcast uh, recently, and that just came out a few weeks ago. Um, so definitely encourage you to grab that, uh, that link and go give that a listen. Um, one thing that is 
unrelated to any of this, but I think is just an incredible thing to highlight the, the um, amount of philanthropy the Dyke Machine has done is absolutely mind blowing. Um, orders of magnitude more donations than any shop I've ever heard about uh, in my 20 plus years, almost 30 years in the business. So um, definitely go give that a listen. Uh, very interesting. But yeah, a great example of a shop that's just getting out there, meeting people, growing their network and growing their sales. Cybersecurity, uh, as I already talked about, a couple shops doing that super well. Southern Machine Works, um, you know, great shop down in uh, the South. <laughs> I don't actually know exactly where they are. Um, they have been very aggressive on the CMMC and cybersecurity posture. Uh, a couple of years ago, they were reaching out to us to see how we could help them and what we can do. And so they've actually been a beta client for ProShop Safe, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so again, they're not waiting till the last minute to, to become compliant. Um, they are out there on the front lines doing it, um, doing it very, very well. So, uh, and then another one here, Olson Custom Designs, they're under the security section, but they quite honestly, kind of like Roush Yates, just uh, definitely go check out their website um, and the video we made for them. Um, they're, they're, um, it's just an incredibly well-run company, uh, beautiful shop. Um, very sales driven. They're out there all the time doing sales, doing marketing, doing branding. One of the things I think is most impressive about them, they're just sort of their brand image is absolutely impeccable, right? With their building, with their facility, with their website, uh, everything they do is just top class. Um, and they, I, I know they attract the types of clients that care about those types of things and are willing to pay, you know, a higher margin to work with a world-class organization like them. So just hopefully those examples inspire. Again, we will send a PDF file with all of these links, just in case you're just too busy cutting and pasting <laughs> and clicking on links, uh, opening up all your tabs. Um, but uh, those are some shops that are really doing things well in all sorts of different areas and hopefully can inspire you as well. So let's get to the part. I only have one slide for this because I don't, uh, you know, again, this is not a sales pitch, but but uh, there are definitely things that ProShop can help with, with all of the things that I just talked about. Um, so we're going to drop a bunch of different links here as well. Uh, driving efficiency, right? As I talked about from the, from the very early parts of this webinar, it is such a cutthroat business. Um, it's so competitive. Shops need to be constantly thinking about how can I cut out costs? How can I drive efficiency? How can I keep my spindles turning more often? Um, and so we, we have a great uh, video on, on that, on driving uh, revenue growth and cost efficiency. Um, instilling confidence in your customers. Um, one of my favorite uh, stories was um, I was talking with a client who had recently gotten a bunch more work from a big OEM. And he, he was talking about how he had done this. And he was visiting this, this company. And I actually, we highlighted this on a webinar. I can't remember which one it was. Um, maybe it was about being sales driven, but he, he went to this company and he started telling them about how, how he ran his company on ProShop and how it was paperless and how everything is one spot and it was all linked and it was easy for employees to get the information they wanted and there wasn't paper travelers to lose. And they were really interested in learning more. And they were in their conference room and he was meeting with I think the, like the VP of procurement and the head of their planning department uh, for their internal manufacturing. And he, they asked, you know, if they could learn more and all he had was a cell phone on him. Didn't have a laptop along, but they had, they were in a conference room with a big TV on the wall. And he said, you know, could I cast to your TV with my phone? And they said, yeah, no problem. So he whipped out a cell phone, uh, connected to their network, cast to the TV and gave them about an hour long demo on pro shop from his cell phone. He said their jaws were basically on the floor. They were just blown away by how he ran his company, how he could ensure uh, success with their parts, how he could reduce risk for them, how he could be cost competitive for them, how he could make sure that you know every I was dotted and every T was crossed with the paperwork he was delivering with his parts. 
And they said to him that they were concerned about some of their other vendors who really weren't pushing this technology. And some of the owners were getting kind of old and you know a few years away from retirement. And they had a lot of part numbers and a lot of revenue spend with these shops that they weren't as confident about. And, um, and you know, this shop uh, won a lot more business from that customer after having that meeting and showing him how he was running his business in such a data-driven, technology-driven way. Another similar story, um, setting shops apart from the competition. Um, we, and there's a link, uh, it was a modern machine shop uh, article. Uh, it's called, Your Competitors Can Do What You Do. So this was another customer in the Northeast area, a company called um, East Branch Engineering. And they had, uh, a they had a big customer that was paring down their vendor base and they were slashing vendors. They realized they had too many, it was too expensive. They didn't wanna work with so many shops. They wanted to work with fewer, higher quality shops. So there was a, a large program that they did that was dual sourced. So they made half the parts, another shop near them made the other half the parts. And um, they're big, you know, big aluminum hog outs. And they sent sort of a procurement quality team to audit and go visit both of these vendors. And when they, you know, went into the competitor shop, they had, you know, an older ERP system. They had paper-based travelers everywhere. Things were disorganized. Their inspection was, was done on paper. Um, you know, it was, uh, it just was not super impressive. When they went into East Branch, they sat them down in the conference room. They immediately started showing them how they run their business with ProShop. They even some of the people that came were new, so new to you know to them. So they even pulled up that company's contact page, put in the contact information of those new people right in there in ProShop, right on the spot, phone number, email, you know, name, title, things like that. They were impressed that they were just like, let's do it right now. Uh, it only takes a few seconds. And then they started looking at some this specific part number that they were talking about, which they happened to be running that day, that time. So they, um, they showed them in the conference room, the part number, how they documented all their work instructions, their inspection plans, their tool lists, everything. And then they walked out and then they actually saw a work order with quantities and inspection results. And then they walked out on the shop floor and saw the machinist there on a, you know, on a device right at the machine, doing their inspections, looking at their work instructions, doing anything, doing everything in a very paperless, efficient, data-driven way. And can you guess which shop got cut and which shop won the entire contract? Yes, of course. I wouldn't be highlighting it if it didn't go that way. So yeah, they chose East Branch. They got you know, all the, all the work that that other shop was doing. And then apparently the contract even doubled again later. So it became a huge scope of work for them. So I love that story. It's just a great example of uh, the real meaningful impact of adopting technology, being sales driven and doing all these things the right way. Uh, meeting regulatory requirements, we can certainly help with that. Um, you know, as I highlighted with the um, with, uh, case study for uh, Coastal Machine, right? Helping get and then maintain AS certification. We've helped dozens and dozens of shops get their certifications and be much less expensive and onerous to, to maintain them over time. Um, I just thought about it. We, we did a, I did a blog recently about the zero prep audit. Um, and uh, the, the concept of always being audit ready, which I believe is the most effective and efficient way to, uh, to run your company. And I know Abra and Sarah are scrambling to find that link now. Um, but the idea that, that you can you know, meet, get ISO, get AS, get 1345 certified with less cost, uh, have it help you build solid business process to run your company more efficiently, more profitably um, is, is only a good thing. Uh, on the cybersecurity side, getting to Linda's question from earlier, Linda. So we have built a lot of new features in ProShop over the last couple of years to check off a lot of the boxes from the NIST 800-171 standard, which is essentially the foundation of the new CMMC requirements. So whether it be you know, requiring uh, or supporting two-factor authentication or um, you know, encryption at rest or password complexity requirements or audit logging and all sorts of things that are um, 
really important uh, to CMMC and you'll not pass without them. So we've tried to build a lot of features to just help make that less expensive and easier. But one of the big things that we're doing right now is, and we're just a couple months away from releasing what we call ProShop Safe, which is an acronym for Secure Access File Ecosystem. So it is taking our existing file structure um, that every shop uses today with ProShop and adding a whole, it's basically reimagining how that is all done on the back end. So it will basically allow a shop to store all of their CUI and other sensitive data on our cloud in an encrypted environment, completely controlled by who can access what files and folders and permissions all through their ProShop credentials. So it, um, uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty huge leap forward in our technology for doing that. Um, and it will essentially allow a company to, uh, maybe with some exceptions, but to a great, great degree, allow them to manage uh, a CMMC compliance without having any of that CUI physically stored within their company at all, not on servers, not on computers, and certainly not in paper. So um, we have clients basically already doing this today. So the concept is if someone broke into your building and stole all your computers in the middle of the night, you do not need to worry about any, any, any leakage of sensitive data because none of it exists on any of your local, local computers. Um, and minimizing that footprint of where you store CUI will be a significantly dramatic cost reduction um, in just the compliance side of, of CMMC and the NIST standard um, in, a, in a way that, you know, we hope really drives cost and allows it to be more accessible to, to more shops. Uh, we know that shops that only do a little bit of defense work might decide to get out of the whole defense game entirely because it's just too expensive and too onerous to meet the requirements. And we're hoping that we can reduce that barrier enough that they decide to you know, stay in those industries because it is definitely a growth industry. And that will include all commercial space. Um, you know, those, uh, all, you know, the SpaceX and Blue Origin and all that stuff, if they're working with the government that is managed through the Space Force, which is a newer branch of the military. And uh, even though it's not defensive in nature, um, it's still, we're going to meet the requirements of all those uh, CMMC standards. So, so that's keeping data safe and security. Um, and of course, I could preach the choir all day long about building robust processes. I think one of the things that we hear clients talk about most, oh, thank you, Sarah, for the zero prep audit, um, that we, that I personally just really believe in is the way to run a successful profitable business is to build really good business processes and have people drive those processes, right? If, if a, um, and who was it? It was, oh God, it was a customer I was talking with. Um, and they said, if my name is in the, is in the business process, then it's not a sustainable process, right? My name has to be completely out of the answer for, oh, it was, it was Jamie, it was Jamie Marzilli. And he said, if my name is in the solution, in the process, that's not sustainable because I don't want to be doing actually anything in the business. I don't want to be working exclusively on the business, building those processes, building the team, setting the vision. And, um, and that uh, ProShop certainly does in spades. Um, and uh, so that's enough on that. Um, I wanted to finish the slides out with this quote, um, which I thought was... I actually hadn't seen this before. We did a social post recently. Thomas from Traxxas Manufacturing, besides my wife, ProShop is the best decision I've ever made. Um, he goes on to talk about, you know, why and what we helped him do. Um, but, uh, you know, we really hope that if, if some of what I've shared um, is compelling enough that you'd like our support in that, um, we'd love to talk to you about it. All right, I, we, see, we have a couple of questions. Uh, coming in here, so I'll I'll get to those. Uh, hopefully, um, Susan, I answered your question before about about what pro, how we can help maintain. Uh, oh, sorry, Linda, um, Susan is her sister. About how we can help make, uh, get certification. Uh, so Pro Shop Safe, and then all the features that we are coming up with. In addition to that, I guess I'll add we are building. So for those of our clients that have gotten what we call our cybersecurity, excuse me, our QMS flying start package, which is basically 
a full QMS and AS9100 compliant QMS in a box, like delivered inside all the ProShop modules, we're doing a very similar thing with CMMC. So we'll have a CMMC flying start package. We tried to do this a while ago, but with when they switched from CMMC to CMMC 2.0, that kind of threw a big wrench in the monkey works for that. But um, so we are re-coming out with a, a fresh one to meet the requirements of the, of the latest standard. Um, but it basically will, if not to use too many technical terms, it will be your SSP and it will be your POAM. ProShop will, will manage your security plan and uh, the, the, all the processes for how you meet the requirements. Now, many of the things that a shop has to do are outside of the ERP, but ProShop will still become, and we, we believe our clients will largely use it the way you do, an AS, you do one of your AS9100 audits and it's almost entirely in ProShop. We believe the CMMC audits will be the same way, almost exclusively run out of ProShop. Um, as just the tool to organize how you meet the compliance, which include many processes that are completely outside of the system. So, but, uh, so that is that. Um, will CMMC be important, uh, be as important for Canadian companies to have? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, I ultimately believe yes, that the Canadian government will have something very, very similar. Um, but I do think there are ways, because this is also true for Australia, um, you, know, the, you know, the defense industrial base is a global network, right? There are, com there are companies in all of, you know, all these countries that are sharing work, that are collaborating on projects, um, and uh, they have, you know, international networks of suppliers. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure it will be pretty important. I don't know the specific regulations on it. Uh, myself personally, but um, that might be something we can share in our forum or something like that. What, if any, impact is there with safe and hybrid? Adrian asks. Um, it's a good question. Um, I'm pretty positive it will be the exact same thing. Um, you'll just be uh, having your files locally stored instead of in our cloud. Um, now, we are helping more and more customers go from on-prem and, and, and off of hybrid as well to pure cloud understand that's not possible for some companies just based on the, the speed and quality of their internet connection. But if the argument up until now has been, you know, our customers won't allow us to, or we just don't feel comfortable with, um, you know, data in the cloud, um, you know, as an industry that's changing fast, uh, you know, for our clients that are fully cloud, we use the AWS GovCloud, which is a, um, you know, a, a server network that is, designed to be compliant to um, all the requirements that the government has for all these things. The government themselves use tons of AWS GovCloud services. Um, so I think from the client's side, that's becoming less and less true that uh, things are more safe on a local network. So um, in fact, uh, some of, we believe it's some of the higher risk to have everything locally compared to uh, compared to having in the cloud because you're very unlikely that your security team is as on top of everything as AWS and our team is that are working, you know, constantly on uh, making that, that solution uh, more secure. So thank you, Adrian, for that. Um, let's see, what is the typical cost? So more, more general question, what is the typical cost for a small company with 20 people? Um, it depends. So we have fairly sort of transparent and straightforward pricing. It's just based on the number of users and the types of user licenses. We have three types. We have shop users, mid-level, and then administrative executive users. Um, sort of very much ballpark um, with a typical distribution of all those three types of seats. Um, you could say on average about a thousand bucks per employee per year. So if you had a 20 person shop, it's gonna be about 20 grand a year for a subscription. We do offer a purchase model as well, which is less expensive on an annual basis, but of course has a much bigger upfront cost. Um, so our sales team would be more than happy to chat with you if you are curious to get some demos or talk or learn more about it. Um, and I will mention, you know, some people are like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of money. Um, it, is a lot of, it, is, it is a lot of money, but if the ROI isn't significantly positive, like you are saving or generating a lot more profit than what ProShop costs you, then something has gone terribly wrong. I mean, we've had clients 
share with us that they have saved more money in so many different areas than, than the pro shop subscription costs them on an annual basis that um, uh, whether it's, you know, reducing actual overhead bodies that aren't needed or can be repurposed into more value added roles, um, whether it could be, um, I mean, we've even had more than a handful tell us they've saved more money on their UPS shipping charges, their overnight shipping charges and expediting fees with their processors uh, on an annual basis than ProShop cost them. So just that those two little buckets um, uh, of cost alone, uh, we're saving them more than ProShop costs and there's just so many other ways. Um, so you, you really need to kind of shift your, your mindset of thinking about what increase, you know, reducing costs and increasing revenue and throughput um, through investment in technology. So another question, what are the chances of a small shop uh, that are in the, that are doing defense work will get attacked? Um, I think I'm, I'm not an, an expert in this, but I know that manufacturing is the top, if not the second um, industry most attacked by hackers. Um, and it is only getting worse and worse almost exponentially every year. So I would say there's almost 100% chance your company will come under some kind of cybersecurity attack at some point or another. Um, and there's a lot that you can do to improve your basic cyber hygiene. If you look up the CMMC standard, even if you don't intend to pursue it, uh, level one um, or the NIST 800-171, it's a published standard. You can go get it, download it, read it. Uh, even level one, uh, just some of the most basic things about password management and employee training and things of that nature can really make a big difference in, in keeping your company safe. So, um, and uh, so yes, uh, again, cybersecurity is definitely a big thing. Uh, what is the best way to do employee training? Um, so uh, Jeff, I'm not sure if that means employee training a pro shop or employee training in general. Um, as far as uh, pro shop based training. Um, we have a very formalized process that we're constantly evolving and improving um, where we use pro shop to manage the training and implementation process of pro shop. So the very first work order in a company's system is this tip work order and it outlines every learning objective from estimating through invoicing and uh, has videos has live training with your implementation specialist. We pull different employees in to the training based on their roles. And that's all documented in the org chart using our company positions module. And as a general, more broad question, that is how we recommend um, doing employee training is organizing it in a system with what roles people are in, what training they need to get to be proficient in those roles, and then documenting different training tasks that they need to get trained in in order to be you know, proficient as a setup machinist or a day shift lead or an entry operator or a buyer or an estimator or whatever that might be. So, um, so that is, and you know, and Shosh Sh Sh Up does a, a reasonably good job of, of managing that whole training process. Uh, so uh, two more questions and I think we'll run out of time here. Is ProShop storage encrypted? Yes, as I said before, with ProShop safe, it's encrypted at rest and it's encrypted in transit between the browser and the servers on AWS Health Cloud. So yes, for sure. Um, uh, Linda asks, will there be changes or additional dashboards in the quoting estimating for sales processes? Yes, for sure that there are. Um, we have recently just, uh, I guess the last version of ProShop has a bunch of new attributes for things like win percentage, um, chances of winning a bid, um, reasons you lost it or won it, um, so we can, you can start to sort of analyze more of your quotes and see why you're winning or losing quotes. Um, but for sure, having a, an entire module for uh, what we call kind of a RFQ module is absolutely on our roadmap. Um, it's a big module. It ties in a lot of different things, but we believe it's really important to um, make sure that quoting processes uh, can be highly efficient. Um, but I will say, I'll just give a plug for estimating templates. The shops that are doing um, estimating the best in ProShop are highly reliant on templates. They have really crafted super robust, really specific, um, yet broad enough to, to not be too narrow, templates that have all of their processes 
even standardized quality checks built into their estimating templates. So I know this is getting a little bit in the weeds, but you know, if you always do incoming inspection for your outside process, let's say anodize or chem film, one of your things is to always check the threaded holes for gunk or damage to the threads. You can build that right into your estimating template. So you, you can add time for it. You can add the, the instructions for how you do that based on your business process or, or tasks. And then every time you use that template to build a part, which turns into a work order, that will flow right down onto the work instructions and quality requirements for the work order. So without any additional effort or time investment. So um, I'd say uh, definitely lean heavily into estimating templates. We have lots for those that are clients today, there we have lots of, we have a couple different webinars that we did client learning webinars about how to um, do those. We won't share those in the chat because those are for clients only, but um, anyway. Uh, so yes, thank you, Linda, for that question. So it is the top of the hour. Um, I'm going to wrap things up. So thank you all so much for joining me today. I hope that was useful. I hope that you decide to, if your shop is um, struggling in any way, uh, that you decide to shift the mindset and what it takes to really be, you know, a world class business, learn to be a better business leader, owner. Uh, read books, watch videos, um, consume our content, and um, uh, really thank you for your time and attention today, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, everybody.